Hi, my name is Carlos Saya Santiago. I'm a marine biologist here in Puerto Rico. And for the past eight to 10 years, I've been using sounds to study nature around here in Puerto Rico, specifically how sounds are, are used in, in the sea by fish and other animals. And today I wanted to talk to you about that and what are some of these instruments that we use to record these sounds and what information we can get out of them and how then we can share that information with the rest of the public to make science happen. So first of all, what is sound? Sound is a wave that is moving through the air or a medium like water. There is no net particle movement of the air particles, but the, air, the wave does move through the air. For example, if I make something like that, my vocals cords vibrate, they can produce sound. So when they vibrate, they're pushing the air molecules together and then they come back, but they propagate the sound with them. So that's why when I'm talking, my, my vocal cords are vibrating and you can hear that sound that you're listening to right now. There are three types of sounds that we can use to understand nature. So first of all, there's geophony or the sound that comes from rain. There's also anthropophony, which is the sound that we produce like when we drive our vessels or our cars. And there are sounds of nature, which is called biophony, like birds that can sing or fish that can croak. Okay, so how do we as scientists, or how does nature use sound to learn about its surrounding? So there are two ways to do this. It's active, active acoustics, or actively producing a sound, and passive acoustics, meaning you wait for the sound to reach you. So for example, in active acoustics, to learn about your environment, you can emit a signal like dolphins do as echolocation to find fish, or as we do when we go on our boats and we use sonar to detect the bottom fissures. We're getting information back from the, from the sound wave. After we emit it, we receive it, and then we get that information. The other way to do it is passively, or waiting for the sound to reach you. So a sound is emitted somewhere, somewhere in the ocean, and you have this instrument waiting for that, for that sound to reach the instrument, and it'll record that sound. So like what you're doing right now is passively here, and, To study the sounds of nature in a passive manner, these are some of the instruments we can use. This is a terrestrial acoustic data logger, where in here you can see the, the casing, where it'll keep it safe from water. Outside, you can see both microphones, that, that's where the transducers are, where it will receive the sound. We can open the, the unit, and you can see inside the screen where you what you will use to program the, the recording schedule with for the instrument. And importantly, there's also the batteries here. So this is your power source and it's gonna determine the length of your deployment um, for passive listening. So as I mentioned, once we have this ready with everything, it can you can add a, a an SD card to record the sounds there. You have it set up, then you just use like a belt to tie to a tree trunk or something to hold it steady. And then this instrument is gonna wait there to passively um, listen for sounds in nature. So what are these sounds that we usually record in nature? We can use, we can hear birds, we can, use, we can hear reptiles, amphibians, insects, but we usually also hear some of our sounds that we create through cars, through vessels, and sometimes those sounds can mask over the natural sounds of the environment. So that is very important for us to, to monitor those environments to make sure that the birds, reptiles, amphibians, all the components, biological components of that environment can communicate with each other to complete their life cycle. So if we move on to the marine environment, this is the recording instrument we will use. So it's an acoustic data logger as well, but you can see it's way more rugged. Uh, it is made to withstand water and water pressure. So if we deploy it at depth, we, we will be able to withstand those steps. 
and still record the sounds. Similarly, like I mentioned, the, the outside, which is the protective barrier against nature and, and all the, the inclemencies. This outside area, you can see the hydrophone here, which is the equivalent of the microphone. Uh, down here, you can see the battery, so this is, will determine how long we can deploy it. In the marine environment, we want to deploy it for a very long time because we don't want to keep going there. It's not as simple sometimes. Um, and additionally, this part right here is the computer where everything's going to be recorded onto. So you can, in this model, you can take out the, this recording unit or this computer part and put it in a terrestrial unit and then you can re record terrestrial sound. So these are some of the ways we use hydrophones and microphones to study nature. So next, I wanted to speak about some of the details that we have to take into consideration when using these passive acoustics methods or these hydrophones and acoustic data loggers to record sounds on the sea. So first of all, in here, we have the hydrophone. This, is, this part is the hydrophone part. So this is a transducer that's going to be uh, receiving the, the wave signal. Here is another different type of hydrophone. So these two hydrophones are different because they can measure different frequencies or they can capture different frequencies of sound. Some have a longer range, longer range of sounds that they can record and some have a shorter range of sounds that they can record. So we have to know the species we're looking for and what are their sound characteristics to make sure which hydrophone we want because some of these can be way more expensive than the other ones. So, in, in, for example, in these ones, if we wanted to record fish sounds, they are low in frequency, so we can use either of these hydrophones. But if we wanted to uh, measure some sounds in higher frequencies, we need specialized hydrophones that can record in those frequencies. The next important part, or the next important component, is the computer. So, in here, we have this computer, and on this system, we have a different computer. So the main differences in these types of computers are how they're, how they're used, like how easy they are to program, how much data storage capacity they have, and what types of, what is the precision of the, of the sound wave that it recorded. So different sound waves need different uh, precisions on how we need to, to, to record that sound. So we can actually change that, change all those features with these computers. As I mentioned earlier, it is very important to think about your question when using acoustics in your science. So for instance, these instruments, because of their relative small size and relative small power that they need, you can put them in different uh, in different instruments. Specifically, you can set it up in a small enclosed area with weights and, and a buoy system to make it drift with the current. So using a drifter with uh, a passive acoustic hydrophone in it, you can create tracks of sound. So basically you could go over and map an area of sound using these drifters. Uh, another way you, we could use it is to add it to other instruments that are already in the field and already available around the world. So for instance, uh, gliders, which are instruments that travel with the currents um, along all over the world to record different uh, biological and physical characteristics of the water column. We could add a hydrophone to it and be able to detect new places where sounds were not known to occur or new spawning aggregations for, for grouper species. So hydrophones have a lot of versatility. They can, they, they can be used to your advantage, depending on what your research question is. So now I want to talk about the way we set them up and give you some helpful hints on what to do or a checklist of stuff you should do to make sure your, your instrument is recording out in the field. Because remember, once it's out in the field, it's gonna be hard if something goes wrong in the field to fix it, right? Because this is gonna be underwater, okay? So I'm not going specifically into how to program each one of these because they are different, they are from different companies, so they all have their own ways to, to program. But some overall helpful tips 
that you should know and understand are the following. So when using, when preparing the, the instrument and after you've laid out all your, your power, your battery power, it is important to measure with a multimeter the voltage of this, uh, the voltage you've created here to power up the device. Because if not, you can either cause a fire or, or burn out the, the system. So it is very important after you've decided what is your, your limit on voltage capacity, after you set it up, measure it with a multimeter. If for instance, you've placed a battery on the wrong side, if it, if it was supposed to be positive and negative, you should be able to see that when you take the multimeter and, and, and get that reading of voltage, it'll be a wrong reading of voltage. So that immediately tells you that something's wrong and then you have to reassess what is going on. So after you put all the batteries and make sure the voltage is what is needed for, for your equipment, the next thing you do is to either make sure that they, they're hold on tight. You could use tape or uh, zip ties or whatever you want to tie them in place to make sure like if they're going on a boat or if like I mentioned, they're on a drifter, if they're moving, you want the batteries to keep the, be tight and keep them safe. So after you've placed the batteries, you've measured your voltage. There's also a very important part here, which is an O-ring. You can see one in here as well. So all these units that are going to be deployed in the marine environment need an O-ring. This O-ring needs to be lubricated. A little bit of O-ring grease is what is going to be used for this instrument. And so you put the O-ring grease on the O-ring, put the O-ring back and put it uh, and close the, the, the unit. So when after cleaning the, the O-ring, you want to clean it with soap, then you want to put some little O-ring grease on it, put it on the hydrophone and make sure there's no hairs or any particle that's going to allow water to come in. So that's very important for this equipment. So you've got the O-rings are set, you are sure that your voltage is correct, then when you're checking your program, you have to make sure your programming schedule is what you want. You can see it sometimes in a screen or sometimes you need a computer to program that. And so you can make sure you have the right programming schedule, the right frequency that you want to measure and take into consideration these things. Another important aspect is for the instrument to have some sort of light that tells you if it's on or off. For example, some units have a red LED that light up when, when it's recording. And so this one or as well has an, uh, a red LED that you can use to check if the instrument is working underwater, right? So after the instrument is closed, it's all watertight, you, you close it and you can see the red light turn on. That makes, you, that makes you sure that, okay, the instrument is set, it's recording, now you're ready for deployment. But if you don't have those things working, you should not deploy, you should go back, check your, your instrument and then get ready for deployment. So after all those things are set, you, you've set it, you've set the, the instrument, you see the light is working correctly. Now you have to make a decision. Do you want to put it in the bottom? Do you want to put it in the water column? Where are you gonna put it in respect to the environment and in respect with the sound you're looking for? For instance, these instruments here have what we call feet, which is basically you put this on the hydrophone with weights and then it just lays down on the bottom of the seafloor like this. You could also stand it up, put a, a rebar on it and with hose clamps tie it. So these are different ways you can set them up and remember that it depends on your question. So if the fish that are close to the bottom and you want to listen to the bottom sounds, you put it in the bottom. If it's something that is going by in a deep side, maybe uh, uh, for pelagic species, you may need to put it in the water column. So those are some of the important aspects you need to learn um, when using these instruments. Now, when you recover the instruments, there are some safety issues that you should always take into consideration. These units are under constant pressure when put on, on the marine environment, right? Because at depth, they're gonna be pressurized. So when you take them out, some of them have vents that you can let the air out 
and, and, and compensate the pressure before you start using something like this to open it because it's gonna be really tight, right? The pressure is gonna compress the instrument, so it's gonna be really tight down there. Uh, and, and you're gonna need one of these for instruments that are threaded, right? For instruments that are not threaded, like this one, where you just push it, the, the pressure off the water column will also push it down, and so it'll be tight. Uh, after you've tightened all, all the screws, but when you get it back, also be, be careful when you're untightening the screws because it can like pop up a little bit. So pressure when you're when you're taking the instrument back to the lab is important to take into consideration when to take it into consideration when opening. Additionally, it's also a good practice to have it laying on the side because when you open it because you don't want water if water is there Sometimes water can get captured here between the O-ring and the seal. So if there's water there, you want it to be on the side so the water will drip to the side and not into the instrument. So that is another, also an important thing to take into consideration when using these instruments. After we've recovered our instruments from the field, we want to look at the data, right? So the data is gonna be saved in an SD card and it's gonna not take a lot of space, but it depends on the amount of the length of the recording. So if you record it continuously, it's gonna take a lot of space. If you did scheduled recordings, it might not take as much space. So the data is collected here or is saved here into an SD card, and it's gonna be saved in a WAF format, which is uh, basically a, a universal way of, of saving sound files. And then we can use open source software like Audacity, or other, other type of software to look at these um, sounds. The way we look at these sounds is through the use of spectrograms. So spectrograms is gonna show you with colors different aspects and different features of the sound you recorded. Additionally, you can look at the oscillograms, which is basically the waveform of the sound that you recorded. Some, some of the characteristics we want to look at is the frequency. So where in the frequency range is that sound produced? We can also look at the duration. So how long the sound is produced for. And we can also look at the intensity. And by looking at the intensity, which is how loud the sound was when it was produced in the, ori in the origin, we can use the spectrograms to visualize that in the color. So that would be your Z axis or your color intensity, cold colors for not a lot of sound and really red and yellow colors for a lot of sound. So additionally, we use the oscillogram, which is just the wave representation of the sound and is also a signature of the sound. Therefore, we can see the amplitude of that call as it changes and is modulated in duration. So the sound can be very big at the beginning, it can then pause and then start again. So with those different characteristics, that time in, in that pause or those characteristics that are specific for that sound can be uh, perceived through spectrogram viewers and oscillogram viewers that are readily available. I want to thank everyone for watching this video. I hope it was very helpful and informative on bioacoustics. Thanks.